Paul, I, I never met I never met Joe, but you did meet him briefly at one point. Just one. Correct. It was um it was probably about a year or two before he died, and there was a little party that I went to, and he was there. We shook hands and said hello, and that was about it. Um, I didn't really talk to him. Um, uh, I, I was thinking, though, uh, in anticipation of this, that way, way back in the early 70s, um, I had a friend named Johnny Stanton. I don't know if you know who Johnny was. He was a writer. Uh, in New York, uh, and very good friend of Joe's and everybody else. And he had a little press, which was Mimeo Books, Siamese Banana Press. In fact, he's the one who did the cigarette book by Joe. He was the publisher. Uh. So I did a little book of translations of surrealist poetry that I had done a few years earlier as an undergraduate at Columbia. And Johnny wanted to publish the book. And he said to me, well, let's see, I can offer you two artists for the cover, either Joe Brainerd or George Sneiman. And I remember saying stupidly, I said, oh, Joe Brainerd, he's wonderful, but he's on everybody's book. So maybe I should do George Sneiman. And I did, and it's a beautiful cover, but I regret not having chosen Joe because maybe then I would have been able to meet him and, uh, could have gotten to know him a little bit. The uh, anthology of New York poets that was edited by Ron and David Shapiro in the mid seventies. Didn't Joe do the cover? It had it was white with red cherries. Exactly. I remember the white and red, and I believe I believe he did. But again, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm pretty sure it was Joe Brainerd because I think I'm pretty sure that's the first time I really knew of him. Mm -hmm. um, because I really discovered the New York School of Poets through that book initially in the mid 70s or shortly after it came out. And so then I that's when I really I mean, I knew some poems of Frank O'Hara, John Ashbery and Kemp Koch, of course, but I didn't know the vast swath of so-called New York School poets that, of course, right. included right. Joe. and. Just to go back a second, you know, my um, I think we're we're close in our uh, sort of being so inspired by the New York School. Uh, Kenneth Koch was my teacher at Columbia. Um, uh, so was David Shapiro. He was actually my advisor. Uh, Ron Padgett is our close friend. In fact, Paul and I haven't seen each other for quite a while with COVID, but we we always have a, a dinner uh, annually. Uh, it's been disrupted the last few years, but with you know with Ron and Pat and with Siri and Sarah Driver. So uh, that's right. You know, we these these people really sp spoke to both of us. I think when we were forming our own ideas about writing, art, movies, etc. Well, I knew these people, and I have to say that um, as an undergrad, we both went to Columbia, of course, but I was a few years before you, and we didn't overlap. Uh, and uh, I had a lot of young poet friends, and they were all taking Kenneth Koch's class. And everyone became so obsessed with him, and they were actually you know, writing poems to please him. And I said to myself, I don't want any part of this. I'm not going to get into that Kenneth Koch vortex. And so um, I resisted I'm it. I'm a rebel. I resisted <laughs> it. And um, uh, I, I don't know if I was right or wrong, but I, I've never taken a writing workshop. I, I just, the whole thing grated on my sense of learn how to be a writer. Um, but there are, I, Ron's work I always liked very much, and I, I, I really did admire Joe Brainerd from the first moment I, I saw his artwork, but then also some of his writings, which are, you know, really, really delightful. Um, I remember, I, I didn't see the early, uh, it, it was, I think he started writing it in 1969, and then he did it in four, uh, stretches uh, between 69 and maybe 73. And there were four little books. And in 
75, Ron had a wonderful small press called Full Court Press, great title. And they published the whole, I remember, all, all the stuff, which Joe rearranged. And that's the book that we know, the, the, the all four in one. And um, that's when I discovered it. I read it in 1975. And uh, I thought it was really one of the great works that I'd ever read. And, um, and I continue to think that. And when Ron was putting together the Library of America edition back in the, I don't know, it was probably 2009, 2010, um, he asked me to write the preface and I happily did it. And uh, so I studied all Joe's writing very carefully at that point. And I started understanding something about the structure of I Remember, why it's so brilliant. Um, it's really like a musical composition, a fugue. And he, he picks up themes, he does them for two or three or four entries, and then boom, he's onto another instrument. And then he's on to a third instrument. And then suddenly he brings back the first one and, and it's woven in so seamlessly. And the temporal jumps are so enormous. I mean, one entry, you know, he's 10 years old. The next entry, he's 24 years old. He's in Boston or Tulsa or New York. And it has a destabilizing and thrilling effect, I think, as you go from one, one to the next. Well, I think that's its beauty also, the, the um, you know, echo, things that echo through its form, but it's seemingly formless. It's seemingly flowing like memory, I remember. Yeah. And so those temporal jumps are totally acceptable. We don't control them in our memories. Um, our memories just feeds us in its own order. And what I love about so much about I Remember too formally is that, you know, it is like memory itself. Um, it, it, he, he did I Remember and then I Remember More and then more I Remember yeah. More. So it, it is this kind of river of flowing memory. You know, it, it, it's an essay in a way, it's a, it is, um, I don't know. It's a humorous observational work. Uh, it embodies minimalism, you know, by each piece not necessarily being related. And yet, as like a piece of music, of course, they relate to one another. And uh, one of the things that spoke to me most strongly, but but also the New York School in general, which is kind of a you know, I, I'm being a little general because the New York school is very wide and has so many disparate kind of voices and approaches to yeah. poetry and other things. But the thing that carries through is a kind of um, observation or appreciation of very small details in life, um, being funny, um, not being ever afraid, you know, oh, always being careful to not take oneself too seriously. Precisely. And these things, they informed me in everything I try to create, you know, but really, and so many of these poets, they, they speak to me and I was one of those people. I wanted to, when I studied with Kenneth Koch, I wanted input from him because I, I did not have any kind of literary trajectory formulated or any artistic one. So when Kenneth Koch would say to me, Jim, here's a poem by Rilke, I would like you to make me a translation by the day after tomorrow, to which I would respond, but Kenneth, I don't speak any German whatsoever. And he would say, precisely. <laughs> you know, and these kind of things were, I don't know. But, but going back to Joe Brainerd, just, just to I remember itself, it's a work, too, that could spawn, and it has spawned, not imitations, but people using yeah. the same form but you see, in his honor. Jim, I believe that Joe stumbled onto one of the great discoveries in modern literature. Simply writing the words, I remember, actually triggers off memories that you didn't know you had. And, and you know, people use this technique in all kinds of writing workshops for kids, for old people, for, you know, adults. 
and students of all ages, and uh, it works. That's the thing. As Siri wrote something about this in an essay from around 2009 or 10, she said, Joe Brainerd discovered a memory machine. And, and, and that was, I think, it all seems so simple and so obvious, but no one had ever done this before. And it really does work as a, um, um, an inspiration to dredging up things from one's past in uh, remarkable ways. So it's, um, it's really some achievement. And I wanna read you, I, in, in the preface that I wrote, there's a letter that, um, that Joe wrote to Ann Waldman just when he was um, starting to, to write this. And it's, it's very good. And I think it gives some of the, the feeling about what he was doing. He says to Ann, I am way, way up these days over a piece I am still writing called I Remember. I feel very much like God writing the Bible. I mean, I feel like I am not really writing it, but that it is because of me that it is being written. I also feel that it is about everybody else as much as it is about me. And that pleases me. I mean, I feel like everybody. And it's a nice feeling. It won't last, but I am enjoying it while I can. And I think that's it. And that's why we all respond to this, even if our memories are different from his, but the specificity of the things he goes into um, is something we can all share. And I think that's the, that's the genius of this little book. Also that idea of triggering something with simply, I remember, it's not daunting. No. You know, it's not like, oh, I'm afraid to embark on exp an expression. No, it's, I remember the color of the trees yesterday afternoon by the road. You know, I mean, it's whatever... It's very um, encouraging of that flow of, of not being afraid of expression, exactly. expressing little things. I mean, he, um, he's so he's beautiful. fearless uh, in a way. He talks about intimate things that very few people would be willing to do. I think, um, and um, and and I, I and I as I point out too, and I, you see, there's a tone. There's a tone of. Of kindness in this in in this work, um, and I, as I say, it is interesting to consider what is not in Brainerd's book. All the things that most of us would probably feel inclined to put in if we were to sit down and write our own versions of "I Remember." So here's the thing: no memories of sibling conflict, no memories of cruelty or physical violence, no eruptions of anger no impulse to settle scores, no bitterness. And it's that sort of benevolent spirit, I think that makes the book so powerful. And you remember that this was the very period when the so-called confessional poets were having their vogue in, in the mid seventies. They all committed suicide, you know, Plath and Berryman and Sexton, but the, these people were writing about themselves, but they were ranting and Joe is just kind of whispering and, and whistling. And um, I think in a way, his book is sustained itself better than a, a lot of those poets. As I was thinking the other day, I read this quote from the uh, composer, American composer, Ned Roram. And he was talking about his love of French music versus German music. And I thought of this in a way like about the New York school versus Robert Lowell and Norman Mailer and Sylvia Plath and that kind of heavier thing. And Ned Roram said, uh, French music is profoundly superficial, <laughs> whereas German, German music is superficially profound. And I, I kind of felt that about these two groups because the so-called New York school, or let's just say, you know, Joe Brainerd himself, you know, the idea of not taking everything too seriously and always keeping humor in there is so very important. And you don't, come on, you don't find that in Sylvia Plath, you know, yeah. as great as those no, poets are. They're all great poets. I, I think Plath and Berryman are very good poets, but the spirit is completely different. And, um, 
I don't think you wouldn't want to take them on the desert island with you, but I would take I remember with me. Um, yeah, it's more inspiring. But here's a little one from one of his. Uh, what were these very short mini essays oh, yeah. that are like one line? One of them is from Freud. We learn that when a wife smashes a vase to the floor. It is really her husband's head that lies there, broken into many pieces. Yes. <laughs> you know? yeah. I marked a couple of two tiny, tiny later pieces. I mean, not not in I remember. This one is called Poem. Sometimes everything seems so, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is... Maybe one of my favorite one sentence works in all of literature, no story. I hope you have enjoyed not reading this story as much as I have enjoyed not writing it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one of his mini essays, one sentence uh, called, you can't lose for winning. He who gives his right arm to be a free man is a free man with one arm. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like jokes too but yeah, yeah. so beautiful because they do make you really think about so many things and about your own life and I be, and it could be very <laughs> funny I mean this one it was a story called May Die D-Y-E and it sort of has a Gertrude Stein feel to it but it's it's better we found breaking bird feathers quite easy and extremely enjoyable and we enjoyed enjoyable things in the most enjoyable way you can imagine enjoyable things being enjoyed. That's, that's a great <laughs> sentence. <laughs> that's very beautiful, yeah. yeah. It's music, you know? Well, the other thing about Joe Brainerd that, that I love so much, because for me, all great, I don't know, people who express things, to me, those that move me the most seem to consider their flow of ideas to be a, always a process and never a result. You know, it's not about the signpost that I can, you know, now stand beside. It's about what's the next part of the fence, you know? And Joe Brainerd was very much um, slippery in terms of trying to put him in a cage of categories because he made, of course, you know, poems, um, he was um, a painter. He made collages. He made, uh, you know, he explored a lot of things. So he he made. He did comics. Oh, I don't know. Co cartoons, he comics. Was, um, yeah, he was obsessed with Ernie Bushmiller's right. Nancy cartoons and uh, also collaborated with many people uh, using those as well. He, he did. So, yeah, he was very open and. Uh, a kind of a dilettante in in terms of form, which I greatly respond to, you know? Yeah, there was, yeah, there's something, uh, I guess what's so interesting and moving about the work, even in its most comical incarnations, is that how clearly it all represents his personality. He, he's shining through all the time. There's something unguarded about him that makes it very very lovable work. And, um, and I, I don't really, I can't think of any other writer or artist whose work I would call lovable, but, but his seems to me to, to be alone in that category. Um, do you, do you, do you get what I'm trying to say? I do. I do. There's something so intimate and yet yeah, unfiltered when you just open, uh, I remember anywhere it's something very so personal and yet so unguarded and sweet, you know, in a way. Right. I mean, he's he's he can be catty and nasty too, which we obviously. Right, right. But yeah, I don't know. He's very very particular. But it's. I, I wanted to ask you though: Have you ever talked to Ron Ron Paget about this? Him just deciding he didn't want to express things in that competitive way anymore. Well, that was Ron's. Uh, you know, Ron wrote a very nice uh, biography of Joe. It's a pretty big book. Um, and he he discusses this question, you know, towards the end of the book. And uh, it's pretty much that idea that that it, it was 
this idea of sharing. And I think in a way, the way Ron um, uh, thought of it is that Joe turned his whole life into a work of art. Um, he felt that he was living it by being who he was. And, you know, he was, he was writing postcards to his friends all the time and sending them presents all the time. And um, he was, you know, constantly thinking of others. And, um, and I think he cultivated this in a way that um, uh, sustained him, you know, through those last 15 years of his life. And, and he said, I, I you know, um, well, look, there's a, before he quit, he, he did a, an interview with Ann Waldman, if I can find it. And it's fascinating because here, yeah, here it is. Um, Ann says, do you think one has a choice about being an artist? And Joe says, oh yes, I think one always has a choice. And when did you make that choice? Joe, I don't think I ever made it, but I think I have a choice. I think I could stop it now. And isn't it too late to stop? No, I don't really think so. I think I could stop tomorrow. I really do. So, and it's true and he did stop. Um, and, I don't think it was out of despair. It wasn't out of uh, uh, some kind of depression that he had fallen into. I think he just simply didn't want to do it anymore. And he, and he, and he stopped, which is a brave thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing your own, you know, instincts. I like this mini essay called Romantic, where he said, <laughs> I'm just sure I'm going to die young, which 10 years ago was now. <laughs> <laughs> That's he also said uh, egomaniac. I guess I must be an egomaniac, but it's funny. I don't feel like an egomaniac. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. Joe Brainerd. <laughs> 